Thank you for coming to Carpenter Library to celebrate Veterans Day. The St. Louis Public Library offers a variety of material about federal benefits for veterans and how to readjust to civilian life. We can also make referrals to St. Louis area resources specifically for veterans, including housing, employment, health, and mental health. While one may not necessarily agree with war in general or the politics of a specific war, I think it's always important to support the individuals who make incredible sacrifices and serve in our armed forces. Tonight, we are proud to welcome Afghanistan war veteran and Purple Heart recipient, Heath McClung, who will present Reflecting on Afghanistan, 20th anniversary. All right. Thank you, sir. Introduction, TJ. Uh, so my name's Heath. Um, I'm from St. Louis originally, so if you're from here, Heck yeah, what high school did you go to? But, um, so I, you know, it's a struggle. How do you, how do you pack Afghanistan to like an hour, right? You got 20 years of just the US involvement, um, at least recently. And then if you look at Afghanistan as a whole, you know, you can go back into ancient times and it's still an area that was heavily contested. Um, so I, I joined the army uh, in 2010 I uh, completed all my training. I, I just became an infantryman at good old 11 Bravo. Um, so after doing all my training, I got stationed up at Fort Drum with 10th Mountain Division. Um, I did a couple of things when I was in garrison. I worked for the uh, commanding general and division protocol office. So I kind of kind of called them the party planners of, uh, of the post because all they did was plan all the big events. Um, but I was actually part of a infantry unit and I deployed to Afghanistan in 2011. So just a little bit of history of the time. I mean, obviously right after 9-11, we pretty much invaded Afghanistan within a few months. Um, so we were already about a decade in, about halfway through the war. But during that time um, with the Obama administration, there was a, the Taliban basically like in 2010 said, we're gonna try to take back our homeland which is southern Afghanistan, um, full of poppy fields and grape rows and just a lot of where their agriculture and their, their money crop is, right? Opium, poppy. So life revolves around the poppy harvest in southern Afghanistan. So in 2010, the Taliban said, we're going to take back our homeland. Um, you know, we're going to basically announce that we're going on a big offensive uh, in the spring. So there's actually a fighting season in Afghanistan and kind of all over the Middle East, uh, typically from early spring until about July, August, um, when the weather just starts to turn and it's, it's harder to move troops and, you know, kind of nobody wants to be outside in a freezing cold in, in a firefight. So it's pretty funny how, how the calendar works out, even, you know, times out when we're going to shoot at each other. But 2010, they said, we're taking back our homeland. And so in response, uh, the Obama administration had a big troop surge. So they sent, I don't remember the exact numbers, but um, my brigade from 10th Mountain Division was one of the, the large units that was sent over to literally like the heart of where the Taliban came from. So I'm, I'm kind of reusing a uh, PowerPoint slide that I used in school for a presentation uh, a number of years back. So. Apologize, there's, there's like some corny things in there, uh, but I'll talk to most of it. But really, um, I've got a lot of pictures and then kind of just some references that kind of help us all visualize what we're talking about. So this is kind of uh, central southern Afghanistan. You see Kandahar on the very right. Um, that's one of two major cities you know, in Afghanistan next to Bagram which I'm sure everybody's familiar with now because of the uh, recent history. But where, where we were sent um, was in this area known as kind of the Argandab River Valley. So you have the Argandab River that kind of starts north of Kandahar, flows down, it goes through Panjway, which is another well-known area of Afghanistan. There was a lot of fighting by the Marines. Also shout out to the Marines today, it's their uh, birthday, so hoorah. And uh, where, we were, this is actually a map um, that shows a lot of US basically large bases or reference points. So this is actually um, part of the operational strategy from September to kind of October 2010. 
So if you see this housing the dot here up there in the middle, that's where my battalion like FOB was, our, our foreign operating base. So kind of a larger base that we use to refit, um, get more equipment, you know, maybe get a rest. But where my company was sent was further down south. So we were kind of a little west of Samsar, you know, about in this area. And our AO basically went all the way up from Highway 1, we see the big red line, all the way down to the Argonaut River. And we had sister companies that were in Samsar, Nalgum, and Samsar specifically, that's where Mulat Omar is from. Um, and Mulat Omar is the founder of the Taliban movement. So we founded the Taliban in 1994. He was basically born in Samsar, uh, was raised there, and that's where he actually returned after studying at a madrasa, like an Islamic school, and became a mullah, which is like a, a religious clergy in Islam. And he started basically the Taliban movement from Samsar and pushed out, you know, kind of ideology and recruitment all over the country. So as you can imagine, you know, the kind of the head honcho guys from that area, it was literally like the heart of kind of historical Taliban. So needless to say, uh, when we kind of stood up these new bases and, and outposts, and pretty much our whole job there was just to protect this area, basically control it and resist any kind of attack to retake kind of this, uh, this homeland as they called it, or especially the poppy harvest to keep kind of that cash out of their hands. So we started deploying in January 2011. Um, I arrived there beginning of March 2011, and kind of my job at the time was um, team leader, uh, point man, and you know, a grenadier is kind of the, the weapon that I carried. So we weren't really going out on, you know, nation building exercises. Uh, we were going out to basically pick fights and try to deny the enemy access to the local villagers. So this is kind of just a general landscape, you know, just I've got several photos, but you can see there's mountains in the distance, but especially after the rains come in early January and February, it turns into a beautiful place. Um, lots of actual green vegetation, it's kind of a river valley, so gets good supply. Um, these kind of huts and walls pretty much segregate like everything, uh, kind of, some of them signify like village kind of uh, order line, some of them signify uh, you know, who owns what kind of farming land, but it's very interesting topography. Um, you can see it's not parts of Afghanistan, obviously, if you have uh, read or seen movies or anything about it, can be very mountainous. This area, the mountains were further off in the distance, um, much more low-lying, heavy vegetation, grape rows, marijuana fields. Um, you can see some more, so the, the pink flowers is all poppy. Um, very beautiful when it all blooms up, um, but they only stay open for about a week or two, and then they close back up, and then after they close back up, basically that's when the harvest starts, and they come through and they, they put little slits with a little knife on the bulbs, and then about, they let it kind of weep out, it's almost like a heavy sap, like a tarry sap, and then about a week later they come through and they scrape that stuff that's kind of oozed out of those bulbs into burlap sacks, and that is, you know, basically black tar opium. Um, and that gets sold all over the world. You know, the, this area in particular is, is the second largest producer of uh, poppy in the entire world. Um, second province next to Helmand in production within Afghanistan. This is looking out of uh, one of the guard towers. Um, on our small outpo outpost called Ahmed Khan. So this is where our company was stationed out of, about 100 guys or three platoons plus kind of a headquarters unit. Um, so this is looking south, kind of where you can see that ridge line off in the distance. That's the other side from the river. So you know, the river's kind of cut in and then you typically kind of bluffs on either area. 
So that's looking kind of on the other side. You can see a little uh, Kiowa helicopter there in the foreground. <clears throat> but again, this is kind of recycled from a previous one. So, you know, the, the population there, and this is what, you know, kind of interested me the most, right? I, I wasn't born a, a natural fighter. I had a lot of younger brothers, so I also, I definitely grew up kind of roughhouse and everything, like to be competitive. But, you know, I, I was really interested in kind of seeing what it was all about, right? I had read books. Um, I don't have a family history of military service. It was just kind of something that, for whatever reason, I was interested in. So I grew up devouring book after book after book about war history, whether it was Civil War, World War II obviously was kind of a big one. Um, but then I started getting, you know, as I got older, into more recent history, um, you know, Africa, Somalia, Afghanistan, Iraq, you know, I was in seventh grade during 9-11, so I was definitely like the 9-11 generation. Like the, the wars kicked off early uh, in high school for me, and I paid attention heavily through the news and reading firsthand accounts um, for a long time. And what kind of interested me was like, you reading stories about, you know, it's, it's usually glorifying like a, a person's story or, you know, a more kind of, um, say, uh, like academic text where it's just kind of laying out, like, this is who's there, this is um, how many people, kind of give you a bunch of numbers and, and data. But this is kind of, from our perspective, I mean, this is what the people were like. I mean, it was predominantly Muslim, you know, daily life revolved around the five prayers a day. Um, you know, we we're oftentimes woken up in the morning by the call to prayer. You know, you, you saw kind of some of the buildings and stuff if we go back. You know, like this is, we'll get there. So like this is somebody's house basically, like their compound. But kind of right to the left of there, there's another compound and they literally had like a bullhorn it was up on a big metal post that uh, was wired to a car battery. And they called prayer for kind of this whole area five times a day. So you'd have these traveling kind of mullahs that would come around, you know, and, and recite. Or sometimes it was just the villagers themselves if nobody was there. But everything kind of stopped at those, at those points in time. So when we actually got into firefights, like, you kind of knew. You could look at your watch and be like, well, it's about 2 o'clock. Like, afternoon prayer's over. So... We're probably going to get hit soon. You could almost set your watch, you know, on a daily basis to when you're going to get attacked. Once kind of we got the uh, the routine down. But this this area was uh, it was the wild west. I mean, we as a point man, I was out on one of the original kind of missions that my unit went out when we were kind of still feeling the, the AO. We went out with another unit and kind of do what we call left seat, right seat rides. So basically you kind of learn from the unit before you and then take over they kind of show you the area introduce you to people so very first time we went out on one of these five minutes after walking off our base we were in our first firefight and every single day for the next you know for me it was about six months um, for the rest of my unit it was 12 and the only reason for me is because obviously you gotta see I've got a pretty cool piece of hardware now um, but every day for me for six months, we were in multiple firefights a day, um, you know, encountered numerous IEDs. And the really interesting part was the people, when we were getting ready to deploy, you know, we were basically told the area you're going, everybody's hostile. You know, everything is just, they've already cleared out anybody that's innocent. And all you have to do is basically fight the people that are shooting at you, you know, super easy. When we got there, you know, get on the ground and you start meeting people and walking into these villages, you find it's a, a very different kind of, you know, view than what you're kind of told from the simplistic kind of intel perspective. And so, they, you know, a lot of people in this area are, are Pashtun, just to kind of explain this slide real fast. Pashtun is like one of the literally hundreds of tribes that are uh, in Afghanistan. Pashtun is one of the largest populations ethnically, but very interesting people because they live by this Pashtun Wali code. And you can see like these are kind of their 11 disciplines. 
But basically what this says is, um, you know, if you treat me right, I have an honor and a code that I have to like protect you and treat you as if you're a part of my family. Um, and so if, if you didn't have like a, a blood feud or some, you know, ancient history with these people, then they treated you with respect as long as you treated them with respect. Now, force is like a big, you know, a big motivator over there. They are constantly, they've been at war for you know, centuries and centuries. So sometimes the only way that they understand is if you basically threaten them. Um, it's not because you want to, it's really if you're just nice to them, then they just walk all over you because they're only used to responding to threats. But what we saw, you know, we would, we would go into these villages and we would sit down at what we call shuras, which is basically a gathering of local elders and you know the men of the village. So as you can tell, there's no women. Um, we did see women. They were always pretty much fully covered up, head to toe in burkas, um, unless they were basically younger than about 10, 11 years old. You'd see girls um, and little boys. And you can see some of these kids. It's really hard to tell ages over there because it's a hard life, right? They farm by hand. There's very little tractors or heavy equipment. Shovels literally, you know, make berms or they move berms by hand in order to let water flow into the fields or stop them up. You know, it's an ancient way of life. Fascinating because you watch this like pre-industrial age around you, but then you'll have somebody with like, you know, that speaker hooked up to a car battery or a random satellite dish attached to like the side of this mud, comp mud compound. So you had these, these like historical times with recent times all meshed together with a society that's still very much tribal. You know, if you talk to these people, if you asked who are you, where are you from, none of them would say Afghanistan, right? They would, they would tell you what village they were from, what family they were from. Uh, even the concept of time was much different. If you ask them, you know, how, how old are you? I mean, that's simple of a question. We would sometimes get through an interpreter like a response like, well, I'm, I'm 10 harvests old or something like that. And it's like, well, how, how many harvests are in a year? How, you know, there's, that doesn't really tell us much by the, our standard calendar. But you know, this guy in the very foreground, he's probably only like in his early 40s, you know, maybe 50s at the latest. And so it was really interesting because you had people that looked, you know, much older than us, that were much younger than us. Um, you know, and oftentimes the people that we were fighting were, you know, this age, not this age. You know, those people are too old, they're too experienced. And a lot of the people, you know, as we were told, everybody's Taliban there. Well, it's sort of true, you know, because everybody lived under the Taliban. Um, you know, in this area, it's not like all, the, all these little villagers owned all this poppy that they were harvesting and, and cultivating every year. They were literally hired workers, and a lot of time they were migrant workers that basically flowed from uh, province to province to cultivate poppy as it basically bloomed in different areas. So the, a lot of these people were literally just trying to survive, right? I mean, like everybody is. So. Some of them were Taliban, you know, definitely talked to people that we later found out, you know, were found dead because they had directly fought us. Um, but a lot of the, especially the younger people, you know, were basically recruited and forced, you know, to fight us. Taliban would come into a village and say, you know, to, to the father or the elder, you know, you have to give us two of your sons to come fight the Americans with us, otherwise we'll kill your whole family. You know, so how do you blame somebody, you know, for an impossible choice? Like, so it's complicated, right? Now, Afghanistan is obviously very complicated. Um, and I didn't want to get too much into the politics of it, right? Because that's, that's a very messy one. And two, it's across a ton of politics. You know, just the war that the U.S. was in went across three, four administrations of both sides. So it's not like we can just throw it blame on one side or one president or whatever. Um, you know, kind of a big mess from the beginning. 
But these kids, you know, most of them were super friendly. You know, some of them were turds. Uh, <laughs> you know, they, they would do stuff like we would give them candy and, you know, the bigger kids would beat up the little kids to take the candy. You know, there are, there are things in that society that, that don't jive well with, with American society. You know, I think some of the, the things that bothered me the most, I mean, besides some of the, you know, brutal things I saw in combat and injuries, was the way that some of the kids were treated, you know, by the, the parents or the grandparents or the elders. You know, I've, I've seen a little girl that was maybe three, four years old kind of run around as we were talking to, like, a group of elders, and she kept kind of, you know, annoying and getting in the way of one of the, the oldest guys there. And what did he do? He just backhanded her, you know, and just sprawled her out like as hard as he could. You know, and it's very hard from our perspective because we can't really like get too interventionalist there. Uh, but you kind of like give them the look, right? And help. we would help the girl up, you know, or, or kind of show the, the more human side, at least from our perspective. Um, the way women were treated, you know, we, we very, very rarely interacted with an adult woman. Um, and really the only times were when we caught them off guard. You know, if we would raid a village or something and, and they were out kind of working um, was really the only time. Or you would see them walking with sometimes as young as like, you know, a five, six year old <coughs> male child was good enough to be the woman's escort. Um, so that, that was obviously very different to see on a daily basis. So as I kind of talked about the economy, you know, in this area, just pure farming, um, there were a few like small little bazaars as they call them or marketplaces where people would trade goods and services. Um, gasoline was kind of like the, the main stop along the way for all the little mopeds and cars that they drive around. I've got a picture later on, I think. Um, but this is almost down to the, the river. And I put this picture in here mainly to show what are called wadis, W-A-D-I-S. So wadi is like an irrigation canal. Um, this is a pretty large one. We're actually pretty close down to the Arkandau River here, so that's why there's so much water there because it's pretty fresh from the, the larger river. But these are carved all over the terrain. Um, and like I said, they provide water to all those fields that are then just dug out kind of little channels by hand to water all of their crops. But this water basically was everything to them. It provided for the, the irrigation for plants. That was their drinking water. Um, there is no plumbing in Afghanistan. So everyone was either, you know, throwing their waste into the, the river here, or they're just going out in their farm fields. Well, we would use these bodies because sometimes in this wide open space, that was the only cover for moving from point A to B. And so, you know, I think within like the first month, our whole company had dysentery because you walk through, you know, some brown water all day and then you're out on a mission so you don't have time to like clean your hands real well or thoroughly wash them and you're trying to get a little food in you. Um, so everybody got sick, but once you kind of get over it the first time, then it doesn't really bother you again. Um, but very fascinating to watch somebody use the, the restroom upstream and somebody gathering water downstream to just take in and cook and everything. But to them, that's that was daily life. Um, and they really didn't seem to be affected by it. Here's another example of like a small little wadi. Um, you know, you can see this guy, kind of this tall guy was one of our interpreters. Um, so he's just talking to some village elders there. You know, most of the time when we would ask them, what, what do you need from us? They would say, we just need you to keep the, the Taliban out. You know, because the Taliban just roams all over. You know, it's not like they stay in one place. So a lot of times they would just simply say, we need security so we can go about living our lives. But then if we weren't there, then the Taliban just comes in and you know, basically has their own demands. And so then most of the times the, the villagers just flip flop from one side to the other, depending on who's in their face with a gun. So I got two pictures here. Um, but one thing that was fascinating 
And I kind of referenced earlier about how ancient Afghanistan is and all the, the empires that have gone there and basically over time, you know, kind of through attrition, have been kicked out of that, that area. So this small mountain you see, so you can actually see a little uh, Constantine wire in the foreground. So this picture is taken from our outpost, our cutoff. But you can see there's actually a US outpost on top of this little mountain. And that's not a uh, entirely natural mountain. So this place is called Gundagar. And legend has it, and you can look this up online, but Gundagar was a, a fortress that was built by Alexander the Great. So literally in the background, or in the background of what we looked at every day, was you know hard evidence of empires you know centuries before us that have been to this exact same place. So I thought very fascinating from like just like a you know kind of nerdy historical perspective. But this is another viewpoint. Um, another thing I wanted to point out was you can see all the poppy here, all the pink flowers, all the greenery. So the next picture isn't like the same exact angle, but it's later in the year. You can see you know, no, no leaves, no greenery, no poppy. So the place has this wild transition depending on the rainy season versus kind of the winter. And it does get cold and it can snow in this area even though you're not up in the mountains. So this is a, a photo of some of our unit moving through the grape rows. So they, um, they basically build these mounds uh, and on one side they have grapevines that grow up and then they harvest the grapes and they hang them up in what are known as like grape huts and they dry them out into raisins and those it's, that they don't really keep fresh grapes because they don't have refrigeration. But this place, these were basically IED, like just minefields everywhere. You know, it's, it provided great cover for firefights because you had these kind of mounds and rows of them. And as you can see, I mean, this, this grape field goes on for probably about three football fields, but they, they knew they would have to move through these, and so they were just kind of like little minefields and heavy vegetation. Not a lot of fun. Uh, definitely had quite a few people get hurt in these. Luckily, not too many US guys. The Afghanis, which this is an Afghan soldier here, um, didn't always follow us, and so a lot of times they would just through uh, frustration or you know, had somewhere to be, they, they would blaze their own path and, you know, they would hit IDs way more often than we would. Here's another kind of example of a, a Wadi. Um, you know, it's actually me in the background with kind of the antenna on there. Um, so that antenna is basically this, this backpack that jams cellular signals. So it's supposed to help us uh, as we move through to make sure people can trigger explosives on us. Um, they're not that great, they're really hot, they're really heavy and the batteries last like half a day. So <laughs> half the time you'd carry one around, it wasn't even on because you ran out of batteries. So this is a great hut. These were, so they would, um, you can see there's timbers kind of at the very top along the roof line. So inside, you know, you basically have this wide open rectangular room with these, uh, these kind of pillars or, or horizontal slats across. And that's where they would hang these grapevines off of. And then they would have all these holes in the side and those are on all sides. And that just let airflow go through so it dried out the grapes faster. But these were also perfect places for people to shoot at us from. You know, they're kind of like mini castles uh, with all these, you know, little peepholes in there. And that, those walls, what everything's made out of, constructed out of, out of is like this just super dense, hard, sun-dried clay, like mud. And those walls, some of them are a foot thick. So rounds don't go through those. Even sometimes, you know, shooting a, a javelin missile or a, you know, AT4 or something at them, like might put a little hole in the side, but it's actually a pretty strong fortress there. Um, we would some, we'd constantly clear these, but you know, by the time they would take some pop shots and then they would duck out on motorcycles and be long gone by the time we kind of moved up to them. But 
cool, they were nice and cool places to kind of hang out, you know, and get a little bit of rest in, but definitely not something you want to see that you have to move towards because most of the time there's somebody watching it inside. So here's an example of, uh, this was actually the largest bazaar or marketplace like in our area. Um, this is Highway 1, um, which is like one of the largest and longest paved roads in Afghanistan. So you can see these small kind of shops and huts or stalls along. Um, we didn't really spend too much time in them because it's not too much for us to do there. They, they actually keep those relatively safe because they, they want goods to like kind of flow. But I'm going to show you what going to the grocery store is like in Afghanistan. So as I talked about earlier, um, this map just kind of shows the, uh, the opium cultivation. So you can see where we were was basically kind of down here in Kandahar province. You know, basically these two and a little bit there are the, the heaviest poppy producers in Afghanistan. And then here's just another graph showing you basically over time how much uh, poppy is harvested. So I did like a little conversion down there in 2011 when I was there. Basically, just in our area in Kandahar, you had about 105 square miles of pure poppy field. So, just to show you, give you a little bit of scale, you can see how it, you know, kind of dipped down a little bit, like when we were heavily there, 2009 through 2011, and then as soon as we were gone, you know, it skyrockets again. And then this one's one of my favorite pictures from my time in Afghanistan. Um, just because this is like kind of a dust. But I mean, it was beautiful. Like there's, best parts of Afghanistan are looking at the stars because there's no light whatsoever. Um, and seeing scenes like these. You know, and this didn't last very long because again, those, those beautiful flowers close up into like these green bulbs. Um, but for about a week or two, every night you kind of look out and this is what it looks like. So not an entirely bad place. Then I had the obligatory uh, who got a picture in here. <laughs> so, um, you know, this was basically early in the morning. This is probably about 5 a.m. Getting ready to go out on a mission. Um, you know, you can see I was a grenadier, so I've got all my grenades kind of across my chest and then just kind of a standard pack out there. Um, the video doesn't work, unfortunately, anymore. But I just wanted to run through those quickly. I don't even got a little bit more time. So brief story about um, kind of how I am today. Um, so in July 2011, um, we were out on a mission. We had been out for about a week or so. And it was actually our day to go back to our larger outpost um, to you know refit and get some rest. And so uh, another kind of platoon from, from our company came out to this compound that we had been sitting at for about a week and took over. And um, let's just say my lieutenant made some interesting decisions this morning. Okay, so there was my squad leader, who is probably the best uh, MCO that I ever served with, um, happened to be on R&R &R at the time, so he was back in the States. And I was at the time this morning there was only six of us, and uh, we didn't have a medic for whatever reason, and our radios didn't really work for whatever reason. But we were walking back to base, and we went through a little village, and, and there were some two guys kind of following us through the village, and that's never a good sign. Uh, but our lieutenant was like, "We're just going back to base, so you know, no big deal. Don't worry about it." Uh, a couple minutes later rounded a corner and basically out of corner of my eye I see you know, an explosion go off and felt ball bearings or I felt basically get punched really really hard um, through my, my knee and into my back um, and then a guy that was on my team too that was in front of me uh, basically you know hit the ground you know in a lot of pain um, and what happened was they had set off a uh, actually what's called a command detonated IED. So I didn't step on a pressure plate, which wasn't my job. <laughs> so, but these guys had watched and waited till we got to a certain point. They pressed basically two wires together and set off this device. 
was a small explosion. It, it didn't even knock me off my feet. Um, and it was only about six feet away from me. But what it did do was it threw out hundreds of ball bearings about the size of a marble or so. And so I ended up having one go straight through my left knee. Um, and I had another one go basically ricochet off a wall behind me and go it eventually hit my lower back but I was wearing, um, you know, my Kevlar vest, and I had my my little rucksack on, and you know, like I said, I'm a nerd, so I, I read a lot of books, and I happened to have this book in my my backpack, um, which my father-in-law actually gave me, who's sitting right over here, um, and basically, as I, I figured out I wasn't dying, right, threw on some tourniquets and and. Thought I was going. I honestly thought I just had a broken bone. I was going to be okay. But we started going through my pack because I'm about to get on a medevac bird, and you know I felt my back and I definitely had a little blood, but I could tell there was no hole. So started going through my pack to make sure I've got all my sensitive items gone before they load me onto the the helicopter. And they pull out this book, and as you can see, there's a, a hole straight through the book. Um, goes clean through. And then this was a kidney pad. So this is a little piece of Kevlar that hung off of our, our small plate carriers um, that kind of just protect your lower back. So that, that ball bearing went through my backpack, through the book, through this Kevlar flap. You see there's the kind of entrance hole, and then there's the exit. And I believe, Here's the ball bearing that actually hit me in the back. So it, it got slowed down enough um, when it went <coughs> through all this stuff that it, it basically didn't have enough force to penetrate my spine. But I have you know what I affectionately call my tramp stamp, you know, because it's in that perfect position. But I've got a nice big burn and indent uh, on my lower back right on my spine. So definitely pretty thankful I'm a nerd and, and keep books in my backpack. <laughs> Everything worked out the way it did. Um, and thank you, Tom, again, for giving me that, that book. But, you know, that, that basically started a, a long journey for me. Um, I thought that, again, I thought I just had a broken bone, was gonna return to my guys in the fight like pretty quickly. But uh, when I hit the hospital, they basically were like, we're gonna cut your leg off. <laughs> I was like, no, no, time out. Um, Cause, you know, I just had like a, entrance and exit wound out of my knee. So my foot and my ankle and everything were fine. Um, long story short, spent about three years doing what's called limb salvage. Had numerous surgeries, like in the 20s. Um, eventually in 2014, so again, I got hurt originally in 2011. 2014, I ended up uh, basically just amputating because I had no other options left. And best thing that ever happened to me, you know, um, let me kind of reach some new goals and keep going instead of being held back by this injury that wasn't getting better. Uh, but that's that's kind of briefly my uh, my six months in Afghanistan, my uh, summer vacation, as some may say. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, I, I basically want to talk today. I uh, appreciate everybody coming because you know really this isn't about me. I know I talk about me. But that's mainly because I just have my singular perspective, right? There's, it's, it's fascinating because even the people that you go through the exact same event with will have a completely different perspective or completely different story, if you will, about what happened. So, you know, I, I find it very powerful to let veterans share these stories, share their perspective. Um, you know, unfortunately, the, the kind of commercialized patriotism that we've seen um, kind of makes some of, some of the regular actions just feel repetitive and kind of you know annoying, to be honest. Um, so I think that kind of getting to know people more on a personal level, hearing their, their journey, their life, um, is really how you can honor veterans. So appreciate the library letting me come out and talk, um, but now I'm gonna shut up and let some people ask some questions, and then I'll start talking some more. <laughs> so, anybody have any uh, questions, either about Afghanistan, just kind of as a whole, um, or, I mean, I'm, a, I'm an open guy, so it doesn't really matter.
Yes. Yeah, I was just curious what your experience was with the Afghanistan security forces. Yeah, great question. And I really glossed over that, so I appreciate you brought it up. So when we originally got there, everything was what we called shana to shana, shoulder to shoulder. And, and that's just past two. Um, but we were supposed to do everything with the Afghans. You know, they were really supposed to be the first ones to contact the villagers, you know, the first ones to go into a compound, not from like a tactical perspective, but more of a, hey, these are your people, like you should be communicating with them first and foremost. We're just kind of in the background, we we're supposed to be in the background to make sure things don't get dangerous. Um, there's a lot to the Afghan forces, right? Just like there's a lot to Afghanistan like as being called a country when it's really just all these tribes that don't <coughs> consider themselves like part of this centralized government or system. Um, so a lot of people that were, at least with us in this area in the Afghan National Army, um, were not from that area. You know, they were from the north or you know, they basically had gotten a kind of a cush job from some political connection. Um, most of the officers were that way. So, you know, we had another whole company of Afghan soldiers that lived on our company outpost with us. And for, I'd say, the first two, three months, um, we did go out on every mission with them. We'd have to drag them out kicking and screaming most mornings. Um, you know, it's, they didn't have quite a, the same, they definitely didn't have the same training. Um, they did not have the same commitment, I would say. It was more of just a, a paycheck to most of them. To most, right? Just like in, in America and in US forces, there are really, really good soldiers that just kind of are natural at it. And then there's really, really bad soldiers that probably shouldn't be there. And so there were some really good Afghan soldiers. And, and we built, you know, trust and respect for those ones that basically showed that they were willing to do the same things as us and kind of like, you know, wanted to learn more. But unfortunately, after a few months, um, we had several instances in which we basically kind of had these showdowns with them. Um, and one particular case that I was actually involved with, we were out at our outpost and we constantly battled the Afghans stealing like equipment and food and stuff from us. Um, so we kind of confronted them one morning because they stole, we had carried out like all these boxes of food out to this little compound that we had taken over. And they stole like a bunch of food. They stole like the cots that we had taken out. So when our Lieutenant confronted their commander, he basically took like tremendous offense and it ended up literally where we had our guns pointed at them and they had their guns pointed at us. Um, and kind of like in a you know, good old fashioned Old West showdown. And that happened several times. And it got to a point where we lost basically our confidence that we were safe around them. And so they did not go out on missions unless there was like some special thing that we had to have them do. Um, so, you know, it was, it was unfortunate, but again, there was a couple that we continued to let come out. It was just kind of as a whole, um, you know, because of certain individuals and kind of the command structure there. It was messy. It was very messy. Um, it's if you look, take it and look at it kind of from a higher viewpoint. You know, there is tremendous corruption from the very, very top all the way down. So the way that you know everything was funded was the U.S. would hand over a bag of cash to their commander, you know, every month or whatever on payday, and we would say, you know, pay your troops. Well, the the commander takes a cut, you know, and then he ends up giving less to the soldiers below him. Tell the soldiers below him, well, you pay your guys. It kind of keeps trickling, and everybody keeps taking a cut until the lowest guy, you know, basically gets scraps or nothing, and of course, you're not going to be allegiant to that kind of that kind of leadership, you know, if they're just taking advantage of you day in and day out. So, unfortunately, I think that's why, you know, again, I will never claim to be an expert on Afghanistan. These are all my opinions. These are all just kind of my perspective. But I feel like that that's primarily where that collapsed so quickly, because you know, over 20 years, if you just are getting beat up by every you know layer above you, then when the time comes to stand up and you know take ownership 
You have no loyalty. You have no commitment. Um, so, long-winded answer, but hope that answered it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you. Yes, sir. So the, that pas Pashtun Wali code it seems to dictate that women would be protected and respected. Yet you've got these fools running around slapping young girls to the ground. Furthermore, they're, these individuals are Islamic, which strictly prohibits the use of mind-altering substances, even alcohol. Yet they're out there growing poppy to be used in black tar opium. Uh, how did they reconcile this issue with, number one, their religious beliefs, which are a huge sector of their life, they pray five times a day for God's sake. But yet, again, they're growing black tar opium. And uh, was this used in any psyops to you know, create uh, some loyalty to the Americans who were trying to net the poppy fields and prevent them from producing? Yeah, I mean, I, I don't know how they reconcile it within their society. Um, because, you know, as you said, yes, they do. They don't drink alcohol. But what pretty much all of the Afghans that we came across, both villagers and in the, the army, I, I don't remember what it's called, but they basically would take um, like what looked like little dip cans, and they would put tobacco in there, poppy tar, a little bit of that resin, and and like usually hashish, right? Because there was kind of marijuana just grew like wildly, really. I mean, there was some cultivated fields, but you walked along any kind of wadi, and there'd be pot plants like growing everywhere, and they grind it all up in. And we'd come across these huge, you know, either burlap sacks full or literal mounds of like ground up hashish. And so they would mix, you know, poppy tar, hashish, and some tobacco in these dip cans, and it looked honestly just like, you know, green snot in a can. And they would dip that. They would put it in their lip. And it made all their teeth, you know, green and nasty. But that's that was kind of their drug of choice. Um, you know, the villagers were very religious as far as just seeing the men go out and pray, um, you know, and greet you in the formal Islamic tradition. But the Afghan soldiers and stuff were not, like not everyone was kind of diehard religious. Um, and as far as the, you know, the PSYOPs question, so that was kind of an interesting thing from my perspective because we did try to sometimes trade with villagers to say like, hey, if you give us like all your poppy, we'll give you, you know, a bunch of corn or wheat or some other, you know, kind of agricultural, you know, plant that they could then, we'd give them seed and we'd give them kind of finished product. And nine times out of 10, they would refuse because one, they didn't own the land, so it wasn't really up to them. Um, and two, you know, they're not going to get nearly as much money for corn as they're going to get for pop. So I think a lot of the decision making again goes back to kind of like a daily struggle to just survive, right? If you're constantly threatened by violence, you don't have like any kind of standard amenities, and every day is just a struggle for, you know, can I not get sick? Can I have enough food? You know, do I have anything to trade with? And can I protect myself? I think kind of overcomes their philosophical views. <laughs> so, at least that's my perspective on it. Any other questions? Yes, ma'am. Uh, sorry that she barked. She's never done that. <laughs> I apologize, everybody. Um, I was just curious how you would describe your transition back to civilian life after you know. Long. <laughs> um, I feel fortunate that. You know, after my injury, um, I had to go through like the medical retirement process, and I lived inpatient in a hospital for about 12 months or so, um, and so I had a lot of alone time, right? I lived in a hospital down in Georgia. I'm from St. Louis, so all my family, my friends, my girlfriend at the time, now wife, you know, was was here in St. Louis, and I feel like that that kind of space. Um, gave me a lot of room to kind of digest and, and kind of reformulate my, my self-identity, um, my physical abilities, and kind of my, my plans for the future. Um, you know, I, I joke, because I was never like a big 
bulky guy, but I joked that like I had to stop relying on my brawn and rely on my brains, you know. So for me, I I um, I started college like before I enlisted. Um, I actually planned on making the military career, and when I first went to college straight out of high school, like I wanted to join straight out of high school. My my parents were kind of not for that. Um, they wanted me to go to college because I had some scholarships and. And uh, you know they were like, you're too smart to just go into the military. Well, I did ROTC, and that was really the only thing I cared about for like that year of college. Um, and so I came home, I came back from Truman, and and uh, I kind of enlisted without my parents knowing. But I planned on basically doing a, a short enlistment and then going back to college and going back in as an officer. So you know after I got hurt and basically I'm told, well, you can't stay in. Um, that obviously had to reshape kind of well, what am I going to do now because this was kind of my, my life plan for now. So, you know, thanks to GI Bill and, and this, you know, I took advantage of all the benefits I could uh, for education. Um, so I ended up going back to school. Um, and when I was in school, I got heavily involved in, in like the Student Veterans Association um, and really kind of connecting with veterans. One, because I was still transitioning like kind of mentally for myself and two you know when you go through combat and, and all that and then you try to go onto a, a four-year college campus uh, it can be pretty shocking trying to relate to you know your 18 year old classmates and your 25 or so um, so kind of get involved with veterans and, and really helping other people transition you know for me I, I, I wear my disability right everybody can kind of see uh, immediately what, what my struggles are. Um, but a lot of veterans come back and they don't have the physical scars, the immediate identification. And so I, I felt like, you know, I've always questioned why it was easy for me mentally to kind of rebound. Um, and so I've, I've, one, tried to answer that question on what, did, what was different for me that I can try to help other people with, as well as just how can I understand other people's perspectives, um, experiences, and try to help them themselves? You know, because nobody wants to be told what to do. But yeah, I mean, my it's a, it was a long journey, right? It was three years, and then I had another, you know, three and a half years of college. Uh, you know, now I've, I work in corporate America and work for the man and all that fun stuff. So, and even now, you know, it's. I don't know if you ever fully transitioned. And I was only in for you know three years, so the people that have been in for multiple enlistments or made a full career out of it, they have a lot harder time transitioning. You know if that's what you basically have done your entire adult life. But I do I challenge veterans um, constantly because I the one thing that really kind of gets under my skin is when veterans even after 20 years of service, right? You know, most people that retire the military aren't that old in the general scheme of things. I constantly challenge them that the best thing you ever did doesn't have to be the military, right? Like it will always be a top, you know, probably one or two, but there's other things out there, there's other things to pursue. And if you just sit back and say, well, I served my time, you know, I did my duty and don't really have like a goal or a, something to drive towards. That's where I feel that people really fall, you know, into the the hardest areas to transition. Um, so I constantly challenge people, you know, uh, but it's it's different for everyone. Like everyone has to find, you know, something to kind of help them relax, something uh, to help them rehabilitate or you know, kind of assimilate. So for me, it was the outdoors. You know, I, I've always loved the outdoors. I had to change a lot of hobbies that I couldn't do anymore. Um, but even just getting out in nature and sitting on a rock somewhere can be uh, pretty, pretty helpful for me. So, yeah. <laughs> Anything else? Or I think we're over time. I don't want to keep anybody. I was going to ask what advice you would give to other veterans, but you pretty much answered that. So I'll just ask you a, a more lighthearted question. <laughs> I, I'm curious uh, about the food during your deployment. <laughs> yeah, that's a, another interesting topic. So, 
um, MREs mostly. Um, because we had set up kind of new bases, we didn't have like a, a really hardy supply chain um, for a while. And even midway through our deployment, like we were pretty low on hot food. You know, we might, if we were out on mission, then it was only MREs, right? Or snacks that people ship you, you know, throw in your pack or pocket. But if you were back kind of, you know, resting, you might get, you know, I think at first we'd get two meals a day, like hot meals, breakfast and, and dinner. Um, but then unfortunately it dropped to like one meal a day just because we just didn't have the, the logistical food and supply. I mean, we had one kind of refrigerated shipping container that housed all of our food. Um, so the other fascinating part is what the Afghans eat. <laughs> um, even just the Afghan soldiers on our base, like they would slaughter a goat um, and they would have just these big dishes that they would put the meat on and that thing would sit out in the sun for no joke like a week straight flies all over it and every meal they would just go take you know a little bit more meat pair it with some rice or some some kind of like pita type bread um, and that's what they, they ate but obviously if, if we tried to eat that and we did one time slaughter a goat like on fourth of july to um, try to have a barbecue and we all got super sick <laughs> I'm sure there was all sorts of bacteria and things that got, but yeah, it was, uh, it's really interesting. I've always been a skinny guy, but when I, you know, and then I got hurt, so didn't eat like very well for a little bit. But even when I like first came back on R&R &R and everything from being there for a few months, I was so skinny and every single guy that, you know, deployed lost a lot of weight because so high, you know, that, and you're so active that you're just burning so many calories that you can't eat enough food to keep up with it. But yeah, <laughs> cold chef boy or knees. <laughs> Somebody ship them good. Yeah, we did all sorts of crazy stuff for food, but now the larger bases they have like good food. They would have like a chow hall, and you know, it was a special treat if we get up there and get some burgers or something. It's always funny because. The infantry guys would show up and we'd be like super dirty, you know, and sweaty and smelly. And we'd go in and sometimes we'd get in trouble for being too dirty to like eat in the chow hall. And it's like, well, what do you want us to do? We're here for like two hours while we just throw a bunch of stuff in our trucks to head back out. Thank you. Yeah. Well, I think that's all I got. But anybody's well, welcome to stick around and chat, but I don't want to keep the video going forever. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you, Heath. Yeah, thanks for having me.